Next, we will look at attached properties, which are a fundamental concept in Xamarin Forms. They essentially function as extra or added properties, which is why they're called attached. Some properties are only needed in specific situations. Attached properties let us avoid adding new properties for every possible situation. For example, when you place a child into a grid, you need to tell the grid where the child should go by providing a row and a column. These row and column values are really important when a child is in a grid, but they're not relevant to a stack layout or any of the other layout panels. Similarly, when you're using a relative layout, you want to set width and height constraints on the child views to tell the relative layout how to size that child. These property values are only needed when the child is in a relative layout. For a final example, pages hosted in a navigation page can opt into having a back button. If you aren't using a navigation page, there's no need for this setting at all. Again, we see this idea of an optional property setting. One way we could implement this is by throwing everything into a common base class. Let's look at this solution and see why it's not recommended. First, we define our base class. To support grid, we would add row and column properties. As we continue this pattern, things start to get more cluttered. Here we have two properties for use with relative layout, and here's one for use with navigation page. As the number of properties grow, the solution becomes unpleasant and inelegant. We've made these properties universally available, however, we really haven't addressed the idea that they're optional. Most of the time, these properties remain unused, taking up space in every object and adding bloat to IntelliSense and documentation. This is not the solution used by Xamarin Forms, just an example of an obvious solution that can't grow well with our needs. The solution used by Xamarin Forms is attached properties. We define these optional properties in the class that consumes them. For example, the button class doesn't contain definitions for row or column properties. Instead, row and column are defined in grid, and then row and column are set on an object like a button. This architecture is very flexible. You can attach any properties you need to an object. For example, here we have a button where we've attached a setting for grid.column. If we were working in an absolute layout, we might attach a setting for layout flags. And for a relative layout, we might need an X constraint. We can mix in any of the settings we need. Our base class stays minimal, and our objects are smaller since we only incur the memory use for properties we attach. Here we have a button with three attached properties. You can think of attaching a property as adding a key value pair into a collection. The act of attaching a value doesn't impact the behavior of the object directly. The key value pair just sits in the collection doing nothing until someone comes along and reads the value. When this button is in a grid, the grid attach properties become relevant. During layout, the grid will look at the button's key value collection to see if there's any grid attached properties there. If there are any, the grid reads the values and uses them to determine the child position. If not, the grid uses the default values of row and column zero. The grid ignores any other attached property settings since they're not relevant to it. There's a lot of code behind the scenes to make attached properties work. Most of it's in two classes, bindable property and bindable object. Bindable property provides a registration method used to create new attached properties. Bindable object provides the backing store. Intuitively, you can think of this like a collection of key value pairs getting added to each object. All this infrastructure is used by the class that defines an attached property. If you are applying an attached property someone else defined, you won't be working with these methods directly. They're simply the behind the scenes infrastructure that makes them work. Here's a specific example of how the grid.row attached property would be defined. Again, we don't need to write this code today, but we'll be using these properties and calling these methods. There are two parts to the definition. First is the public field that is the actual definition of the attached property. Notice the property suffix on the name. All attached properties follow this convention. Next, we have get and set methods used to read and write these values. In our analogy, these methods add or retrieve the desired key value pair from the bindable objects collection, the value for grid.row in this case. Here's what you would actually need to write to set an attached property in code. It starts with the button to which we want to attach a key value pair. Then we call the set method and pass in the button and the value. This attaches the key value pair grid.row equals one to the button. Since attached properties are often used for UI layout, they're commonly set in XAML. The syntax is class name dot property name. Notice the property name does not include the property suffix. So it is grid.row and not grid.row property. The XAML parser understands this syntax and will correctly attach this key value pair to the button.